All right, section two in chapter 27, we're going to look specifically at the Korean War and McCarthyism. Uh, Korean War is important because it's still, uh, the impacts are still felt in the world today. And McCarthyism is starting, the idea, the concept behind this is starting to make a comeback, especially with uh, people's concerns with the government, uh, government surveillance and phone tapping, things like that. Right, so just a quick little background on um, some of the, one of the, you know, we had Berlin, the first hot spot, getting into a little bit more of a global mindset. All right, 1949, China is going to ha undergo a revolution, right, and it's going to become communist. So here's the Soviet Union up here, so you can see communism is starting to spread, right? And that's going to worry the United States because now you're looking at all of Southeast Asia possibly becoming communist as well. So Chinese forces uh, overthrow the nationalists. We actually supported the nationalists, right? Once again, there's that idea of containment. But here's where we get into Korea, right? Korea is located right here on the map, right? After the war, Korea is going to be split in half, right? North of the 38th parallel, which would be a, um, the, the, that would be a line of uh, latitude going this way, all right? Above it was North Korea, Right, which ends up becoming a communist country. The Soviet Union has influence there. China has you know, just as much influence as well. And then the United States is going to support South Korea, which is still, uh, still the same mindset today. North Korea right, is very much anti-United States, and South Korea is one of our allies. We do have troops stationed there. All right, now we look at the actual conflict, okay? Uh, North Korea, in an attempt to spread communism and unite Korea, is going to send troops into South Korea. Now, the United States turns to the United Nations, newly formed, right, after World War II, right, and a, uh, United Nations troops are then going to be sent in, right? Now, most of the troops were from countries around the world. Uh, well, all the troops were from countries around the world, but most of them are going to be specifically from the United States. So this guy down here, Douglas MacArthur, he becomes the commander of all UN forces, right? He is going to be a you know, very tough person, have a very strong personality, and we're going to see how that comes back to hurt him later on. Right, so this map is showing you some of the different phases. I put the red line here. This is the stuff we're going to worry about now, and this stuff we're going to worry about uh, in a little bit. Right, but here's the, the initial uh, North Korea invading South Korea. You can see here's the 38th parallel, the line of latitude dividing them. The green is showing you the Allied forces or the UN forces, South Korea. So the initial stages, North Korea, Korea almost completely overruns South Korea. So UN forces come. Right, we now actually drive the communist forces of North Korea back towards China. Now this is where things start to get a, a little sticky. All right. Um, China basically warns, the, here's China again, China warns the United Nations that if they continue to advance through North Korea, that they were going to have to get involved. Once again, China was communist, North Korea was communist, right? MacArthur, the, the general I told you about before, you know, hard-headed, really strong and firm, okay, he is going to order his troops to continue to advance. And, you know, the United States was very wary of China getting involved, but because MacArthur ignored uh, his orders, right, and, and continued advancing, now China is going to be involved, right, and this is where things start to get, uh, start to get a little sticky, right, this is showing you a modern map of North Korea, North and South Korea, right, but MacArthur wants to go a step further, he now wants to go to war with China, which Truman doesn't want to, remember, we just finished World War II, we don't want to have a direct conflict with the Soviet Union, Right, which if we went to war with Korea, we would. All right, we all know why we don't want to go to war with the Soviet Union because of, of nuclear war. But Truman actually, or excuse me, MacArthur actually tries to go over Truman's head and he gets the, the newspapers and the American public involved saying we need to do this, we should do this. And Truman eventually just had him canned, fired him. All right, he was the commander in chief. He had that power. All right, and then uh, after Truman's term, Dwight D. Eisenhower, you should remember him. He was a famous World War II general. He led the Allied landing at D-Day. He becomes president, and one of the things he promises to do is end the war quickly. All right, now we get into McCarthyism, right? Now, you're going to have a, a, a little treat here in a second from Mr. McCarthy, right? So, uh, you know, just uh, come back after that and maybe look at this, just to some of the facts here, right? And then I found uh, this, this funny poster here. Right, Uncle Joe is from the clip as well, but McCarthyism is something that is definitely coming back because if you, uh, you know, if you get charged with something or someone accuses you of something, right, your reputation is what gets hit. All right, we're here talking about Section 2 of the Korean War McCarthyism. I'm here with my, my good friend, Mr. McCarthy, the other 8th grade science teacher, Mr. Johnson's uh, co-worker co down there. 
Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is the Red Scare, the second Red Scare after World War II, and a guy by the name of Joseph McCarthy. Do you know him? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, my, my, my Uncle Joe. He, uh, he used to come to, uh, to our house for holidays, uh, Thanksgiving and, uh, in particular, and we used to go outside and play, play football, and he was, he was kind of a, a crazy cat. He would do an awful lot of yelling and screaming. He was always on a soapbox about, about the other people in the family that were a little sketchy, maybe had some associations that weren't very nice. So Joe McCarthy was your uncle? Joe McCarthy, yes. Uncle right. Joe. So whenever you see something about Joseph McCarthy, whether it's in your notes, and your work pack, or on your test, you're going to think about this McCarthy. Not really his Uncle Joe, but McCarthy, McCarthy. After World War II, right, there was that massive fear of communists. So Joe McCarthy, he was a senator from Wisconsin, he actually used some of the same tactics that you know, the Romans used against Jesus Christ, that Hitler used against the Jews and other groups he deemed undesirable. He was able to whip up this fear, this mass hysteria against communists. Do you want to tell everybody what communists are? Sure. In case we maybe don't remember. Uh, communists would be uh, countries like the USSR, China, North Korea. Uh, those are countries that are, are governed by a, a group of people that are very selective and everybody else more or less suffers. It's supposed to be all sharing, but that's not exactly how that works out. Um, but yes, my, uh, well, not my Joe, but um, Joe McCarthy he used um, to, Uncle Joe McCarthy. Uncle Joe McCarthy. He, he used, uh, uh, he was not very well known to begin with. He was just that kind of average kind of guy in, in, the, uh, in the Senate. And then he started, he made a speech where he accused 208 people of, uh, he had a list of State Department employees that were, were associated with communists and that the government knew about this and they were not doing anything about it. And so this created quite a, quite a, Hysteria because communism was we were in the middle of the Cold War, it was ratcheting down some serious uh, accusations back and forth. So then people started asking him about his evidence about this, and he had these big uh, hearings, and, and it, was, it was a really big deal, but he never really had any substantial evidence for this. But he, he ruined people's lives, he accused them and, and uh, people's families, and really ran them through the, through the ringer. And yeah. it was, it was really we do have a family portrait. Mr. McCarthy was able to pull this out. You can maybe see the likeness. I think Mr. McCarthy is just a little bit more uh, better looking. But the important thing he touched on there was that he didn't have any hard evidence, all right? So the term McCarthyism is where you accuse somebody of being a spy or a traitor or right, not loyal to the country without having any actual evidence. So you would just walk around and be like, you're a communist. And guess what? People believed him. So if you had a really good job, a respectable job, and you were accused of being a communist, you were fired from your job, you were possibly arrested, right? People kind of just shunned you because you now have the label of being a communist, all right? So make sure we kind of make that connection between this Mr. McCarthy and this Mr. McCarthy, okay? All right, you're good. <coughs> Listen up. My name is Mr. McCarthy. I speak in the office. I have a list right here of people, students in this room, who are part of a resistance group whose sole objective is to disrupt our evacuation drill procedures. I'm going to name them now. They need to go to the office. Victor, you, you're part of this group. You're the leader. I know you are. I have evidence right here. Get out. Go. Michael Conklin, where are you? Don't try to hide from me. Michael Conklin, your life's about to be ruined. You've been identified. I have evidence right here. Don't mess with me. Not even joking. The FBI is right behind him. They will come in and have you removed. Tell me where Michael Conklin is. <laughs> I remember the theaters. It's not Get out. You have no proof. Really? No proof. We'll find out. Let me hear it. You'll have your chance. Good, Good luck. Ridiculous. <laughs> Cheyenne. You. Member of this resistance group. Out. <laughs> if I find out that any of you have any ties to these people, you will also be removed. You'll spend the rest of your time in ACES. Yes. I'll be back. Yeah. Stay away from that resistance group. Watching. <laughs> Always watching. All right now. On to the scary stuff, all right? Um, Eisenhower was going to be a little bit more firm than Truman was. Truman, you know, wanted to follow his policy of containment, right, try and prevent the spread of communism. 
Eisenhower was a little bit different. He had that military mindset, and he followed a policy of brinkmanship, which simply means we will go to the brink of war if we have to to stop the, stop the Soviet Union from spreading communism. Right? So this is going to create a monster arms race throughout the world where both sides, the communists and the democrats, all right, are the, 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 the democracies, excuse me, which essentially is the United States and the Soviet Union, they are going to be competing with each other to see who can come up with the most powerful weapons. Right? And that was the idea of massive retaliation. If you know, we were to be attacked by the Soviet Union, we would then have to retaliate with our full nuclear arsenal. Right? Sometimes, I added this down at the bottom, sometimes it's referred to as mad, mutually assured destruction, which I know I've talked to some of you guys about. And this political cartoon is simply you know, driving that message home. So you have two sides that are fighting one another here, right? and then they have these big, huge nuclear weapons behind them, but yet they're still using bows and arrows. And the idea is that we can't use the nuclear weapons because if we use our nuclear weapons, you know, the Soviet Union is going to use theirs, and it's going to destroy the planet. Okay? Uh, looking at the Cold War elsewhere around the world, all, right, all throughout the world we were trying to stop the spread of communism, all right? and we actually overthrew, um, you know, used special forces to overthrow some governments right, around the world. So this one up here is in Iran, 1953. Some of us are doing um, the Iran-Contra affair or the Iranian hostages. We were actually involved in Iran uh, long before that happens. 1954, we helped overthrow the government in Guatemala. And then the Suez Canal crisis, right, we don't get directly involved. Um, you know, we do send, send some help and some aid, but it's more Britain because Britain owned the Suez Canal. Egypt tries to take it over. The Soviet Union threatens to get involved. Once again, we're pushed to the brink of war, but people, you know, we, the, the conflict ends up being resolved without war. Right? And then on to a non-military uh, non effect of the Cold War. Right? Starting in 1957, both countries are going to com have a competition, a race, to see who can make the, 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 the most advances in space. Right? So the Soviet Union wins, wins the first leg of the race by sending Sputnik into outer space, which was the first satellite. Okay? We are then going to pump billions and billions of dollars trying to compete with the Soviet Union. Right? And this now sees um, you know, the first dog go into space, man go into space, the space, you know, um, sending up the International Space Station. This is going to continue until the end of the Soviet Union where we start working together. So it's more whoever it has the better space technology is the more powerful country. Right? And this is just kind of summing together right, um, kind of the space race. So just do, you know, hit pause and look at it. Uncle Sam is always symbolic of the United, Na of the United States and the, a bear is always kind of symbolic of the Soviet Union. All right, one more incident that put us, pushed us almost to the brink of war was the U-2 incident. Right? The U-2 was a spy plane that the U.S. used, and here's a picture of one down here. We also use it during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right? But essentially what we were doing was before Eisenhower met with the, the leader of the Soviet Union at this time, Nikita Khrushchev, all right, um, there was a, uh, an American spy plane that was shot down over the Soviet Union. And Eisenhower tried to deny it, but Nikita Khrushchev had the parts and the plane. Right, so that led to, you know, once again, you know, pushing us almost to the brink of war. All right, and then this is a, a famous picture. You guys actually wouldn't believe it, right? But your parents and your grandparents did live through this. It was definitely way before my time. But these are what we refer to as air raid drills, right? Where in the event of a nuclear bomb, okay, students were trained, just like we have fire drills and evacuation drills, they had air raid drills. Right, where they were you know, instructed to hide under their desks, which we know that if a nuclear missile were to be launched, that the desk is not made of some nuclear deterrent plastic or wood, right? but it was essentially everybody was preparing for such a disaster.